Insightful Podcasts by Informative Hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Your hosts are Joseph and Madison Whalen, a father and daughter team making their way through the challenges of the teenage years. Welcome to Insights into Teens. This is episode 57, Academic Expectations. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my intelligent and accomplished co-host, Madison Whalen. Hello, everyone. How are you doing today, Maddie? I'm okay. Wow, that's enthusiastic, isn't it? Yeah. So today we are talking about academic expectations. Whoa. And what do you think academic expectations are? Um, if I had to guess, it would be, um, basically, um, if your school wants you to be at a certain level so you can move on to the next grade, if your parents want to have, um, certain grades, um, and even if you want to have certain grades. Okay. And, and your grade level is definitely an important part of academic expectations, but it's not everything. And we're actually going to kind of gloss over the grade part of this because I think everybody knows your academic expectations are to get good grades. Yeah. So the way that we are defining expect, academic expectations is academic expectations mean more than just learning the subjects you're taught and getting good grades. It means growing as a person intellectually, socially, and personally. To do that, your time in school focuses on four major principles, all of which you are at the very least expected to be competent in, but hopefully will excel at. Those four things are building learning capacity, collaborating, making meaning, and breaking through. So these are the four things that we are going to be talking about today, and we'll break them down in their component parts and talk a little bit more in detail without actually, you know, trying to lean on you to get straight A's or anything, since you do that already. So shall we get into it? Sure, why not? All right, here we go. So building learning capacity is the um, practice of developing learning capacity through goal setting, personal growth, and academic achievement. Um, and there's oh, five major points to how we do this. And I want to get your thoughts on this because a lot of these things we've actually kind of touched on already uh, in other podcasts about different things. So the first thing they talk about is realistic expectations. Straight A's are desirable, but not required. Um, do you think you've got realistic expectations on yourself as a student? Um, I mean, being a straight A student for a few years now, honestly, my goal is just to try and keep that streak. And I definitely think that's quite realistic. I'm pretty smart. Okay. Um, and I definitely think that is a pretty realistic goal um, to have in mind. Um, just to try to keep up with the good grades, basically. So do you think that your expectations on yourself might be a little high, might be a little low? Could you expect more from yourself? Are you expecting too much? I might be expecting too much sometimes because I have breakdowns um, on occasions. Okay. So so that might be an area of improvement that we can work on. And we've talked about that. Yeah. Uh, the next thing that they talk about for building your learning capacity 
and we've talked about this too, and that's rest and energy. A good night's sleep and a well-balanced diet could mean the difference between a B and an A. How much focus do you put on getting a good night's sleep? Is it important to you? Um, I, I try to get a good night's sleep, but on occasions I do have nights to where I can't fall asleep. Like sometimes at like one point in the night, I'm just like, I want to go to sleep. I want to go to sleep and I don't. I'm trying to have a better mindset on at one point I'm going to get to sleep and that's um, helped me more than I want to go to sleep, I want to go to sleep, I want to go to sleep. Right. And we've made changes to your your evening schedule as well Yeah. to try to help uh, accommodate that need because you would stay up until, you know, whatever your normal time for bed was doing whatever recreational activity you were doing, whether it was video games or Legos or, you know, whatever recreational time you had and then you found you were having trouble getting to sleep under those conditions. What did we do to try to resolve that? Uh, you limited my technology time and eventually it turned into me just hanging out with mommy and watching a movie for the next hour. Right. So you, you basically have an hour of downtime and that hour of downtime is just relaxing, watching a movie, you know, not being inches away from a screen, you know, with your brain, going a mile a minute like it normally is with technology and stuff. And it's a chance for your brain to just sort of settle down a little bit before you go to sleep. Mm -hmm. Now, have you found that that's helped you at all get, you know, get to sleep sooner and get better sleep? I mean, I've never really been a judge. I mean, I've definitely gotten better with sleeping than I have before. I'm not like just constantly awake for hours on end. I mean, I'm still awake for at least maybe two hours, but uh, most of the time I am able to get a good sleep unless I just have like a bad night and I need to have um, some consolation with mommy. Okay. So let's talk briefly about a well-balanced diet. Do you consider your diet a well-balanced diet? Um, Based on the food I've been given, probably. Okay. I mean, like, I do snack here here and there but mommy makes sure to give me a well-balanced diet i have a good breakfast she always makes sure to pack some type of food with my lunch and i have a pretty well-balanced dinner even though i don't normally eat all the um same foods you guys do right now do you find uh during the average school day that you just sort of run out of energy midway through the day or are you able to pretty much keep your energies up throughout the day it really depends. Like, I I normally eat. I, I eat, like, um, I kind of eat um, the same amount of food every day, and my lunch is pretty early. Yeah. I mean, on half days, I could literally just have breakfast. Yeah, it's kind of silly how early they've got your lunch. Yeah, but, um, thing is, like, sometimes if, like... I'd just be, like, extra tired, like, not getting up. If I didn't get a good night's sleep that night, I might just be too tired. And I do have to admit, sometimes I don't eat all the food I'm given. Um, sometimes I just, like, sometimes with pancakes, I don't eat them all. Right. Um, is oh, that just that you're not that hungry, or is there another reason? I don't know. Um, some days I don't really want to eat all that I mean, sometimes it's just I want to get to school faster. Um, other times it's just I don't really feel hungry. And occasionally it's just, okay, I don't want to eat this. Okay. But you don't find yourself lacking in food or anything and you're not falling asleep in class or anything? No. I mean, sometimes I do feel tempted, but um, I wouldn't even be able to fall asleep if I even wanted to. Okay. Well, the next thing that they talk about is focus and, and, you know, part of that rest and balanced diet help you to maintain that focus. Um, but the focus itself is really kind of a set of tools that you use in school. Um, like, you know, they, they say, don't let your mind wander and use some focusing techniques. 
And they offer a few here. I'm curious if you use any of these. So the first thing that they talk about is writing down what the teacher or lecturer is saying. So not maybe word for word, but listening to certain key words, certain key phrases that stick out that might be important. And writing those down help to commit them to memory and help to keep you focused on what the the teacher is saying. Do you do you take active notes during school? Well, sometimes we have focus notes where we um, write notes about a certain topic that are normally on the board, and the teacher goes in the f- like more explanation on how they are. Um, and I definitely think while writing them down, I'm able to listen to the bigger explanation because some of the like. Some of the um, PowerPoints might not make that much sense, so we can, like, listen along to a better explanation of it. Okay, that makes sense. The next one they talk about is writing down questions. So as the teacher is talking about things, and I find myself doing this if I'm in a meeting or a webinar or something like that, where I don't want to interrupt the teacher while they're lecturing or talking or the speaker, but I'll jot down notes that I can come back to and ask later to get better context on. Do you find that you write down questions that you might have during a, a, a lesson? Not really, no, because I don't ask a lot of questions in school. Do you not need to ask questions? Are you shy asking questions? Is there a reason for not asking? Um, It's kind of half and half of the two you said. Normally I don't need it, and sometimes I'm just a little too shy. Okay. One of the other ones that... I've heard in the past, and I've used and found it to be very effective, is to focus on the speaker's mouth. Because sometimes what we learn as a society is when you're talking to someone to look them in the eye. And and that's fine in a one-on-one conversation, but when you have a speaker who's talking to a crowd or a group of people, they're not going to maintain eye contact with you. So in order to maintain focus on what they're saying the suggested practice is to focus on their mouth and almost make a game of trying to lip read while you're hearing what they're saying. And that helps you to focus on the actual subject. Do you do anything like that in class? Not really. No, I find it hard to look at people, even just like trying to look at like different parts. I find myself just getting nervous. Like, when I just see that they just catch my eye at one point, I just have to like look around because I just get a bit nervous. I don't. I'm not good with eye contact with people. I don't. I'm not really used to looking at, um, in the eyes. And sometimes I'll just have. I do sort of the opposite. I get scared and I just like look in other places, hoping that they look away from me at one point. And and you know that's sort of a practice that happens when you're in, you know, a public environment, and you find yourself, you know, looking at someone or you know staring at someone even though you don't intend to and they sense you're looking at them and they look at you and and you're almost startled and you look away yeah like that sort of that effect i I get that i can understand that uh what about distractions you know how are you at handling distractions in the classroom other other kids maybe somebody walking by in the hall something that's going outside going on outside through the window are you easily distracted in class um not Not really, no. Like, I can handle, like, when kids, like, in my math class since the last two periods, when the second period bell rings, everyone else is, like, getting out of the classroom while we're still in. Um, I'm not really distracted by them. I mean, I do hear them, but honestly, I really don't pay any attention to them. But other kids just acting like class clowns and just, like, screaming out of... The annoying kids. Yeah, the annoying kids. It's kind of hard to handle them. I'm still trying to figure out how to handle them. Yeah, it's tough. It takes quite a bit of adjustment. Uh, And the last one on focus they talk about here, and this is more for studying, but certainly when you're in class as well, uh, getting a lesson... And that is to make yourself as comfortable as possible. Now, I know chairs in school are not designed to be comfortable. Nope. Not by any stretch of the imagination. Do you find your mind wandering if you're sitting too long? Uh, Do you need to get up and move? Do you need to shift around a lot in your chair? Like, is it, are you fidgety, I guess, when you're sitting in class? I mean, sometimes when I accidentally, like, sit on my leg for a little too long or if my legs are in a weird position, if I'm too close, if I'm not close enough to my desk, I end up um, shifting. I don't do it too often, but it's 
um, often enough to the point where I can notice that I'm doing it, but I can't help it. That makes sense. The next thing they talk about in building your learning capacity is very important, and that's learning how to study. Um, So the first thing they talk about here is sort of what we touched on with focus is taking notes. Do you take, do you think you take good notes? Like, do you review your notes later on after class and find that they help you? I mean, yeah, like, especially with definitions, like definitions, like if you're ever having like picture a science test and like they give you like notes on the definitions and it's like sort of similar to the paper like studying over those notes and like knowing what the definitions are um can definitely will definitely help me and whenever i take notes with definitions um i definitely can remember because like in let me just say in history we're learning about feudalism um and just having the definition of what fl- feudalism is and like having the de- like like having the definitions for the topics that we have on the podcast is easy to like go for a reference basically. Right. That's a good point. Very good point. Uh, they also talk about taking short breaks. So when you study or even when you're doing your homework, what do you do to take a short break? And I already know the answer to this because I saw you today doing it. Um I just normally, whenever my cat goes, I just sit with her. Occasionally, if I have to go to the restroom, I do that. But other than that, I really don't take breaks. And the only other time I've ever taken a break was when I was writing. And I basically went in my room for five minutes, and guess what I did? What'd you do? I put away my laundry. (laughs) Wow, that's exciting. I just do, like, productive breaks. I probably should take a few more breaks, but I want to get my homework done it's probably not the healthiest solution but well i mean it's it's nice to have the determination to want to work through what you have to get through Uh, and i think of all the things you mentioned i think probably your cat breaks are your healthiest ones both for you and for the cat yeah um but that's good uh they also talk about giving yourself rewards so do you ever do uh, self-initiated rewards like, all right, I've got five pages to, to read tonight. And if I get through the first three pages, I'm going to give myself a snack and then we'll come back and, and finish the other two. Anything along those lines? I mean, that's kind of what I was doing today. Um, when I had like, like, that's kind of what I do sometimes when I actually have my homework. Like, when I finish my math homework, which is, like, the main priority. I normally go up and get a small snack, and then I go back to anything else I have. Today, it was just going and painting something after I finished um, one of uh, my things for my projects. Okay, so, like, painting was a relaxing thing to get your mind centered again or something like that. Almost like a meditative type. Yeah. Cool. Um, the next thing they talk about, and we've talked about comfort already, is find a comfortable, quiet place. So when you study, do you sit at the table and study? Do you sit at your desk? Do you lay in bed and study? Where do you find as the, the best, most conducive method of, of comfort for you to study in? Honestly, going at the kitchen table, that's probably the most one because we have like nice windows that have... They bring in a lot of light, and it's easy to see. I honestly think if I was just in my room on my bed, I'd get way too comfortable. Right. Um, so I don't want too much comfort. I just want enough to where um, I'm not, like, in pain and just wanting to, like, get out of there and stop studying. But okay. I also don't want enough comfort to where I just feel lazy and don't do it, which is why I use the kitchen table because... Um, it keeps me in my upright position. The chairs aren't exactly comfortable, but I can handle them. And um, I just find it easy um, to study there. Well, you know, it's funny with, you know, all the coronavirus stuff going on and a lot of people having to work from home, a lot of <clears throat> helpful websites are, are popping up to give do's and don'ts. And one of the things they say about working from home is don't work from your bed for those exact reasons is you'll be too comfortable. You won't be focused and you won't get anything done. Uh, so that's a very good point, but it's funny that you mentioned use good lighting because that's what the next suggestion is for studying here is you want to study someplace where you have good light. 
Yeah, honestly, I really don't have too much good light in my room. I only have, like, two lights. Sure, there's one right by my bed, but honestly, it's a little blaring. But, um, the one by the window, if it's, like, a nice sunny day out, honestly, it lets in just enough light to where it's not overly distracting, but it's just enough to where you can actually perfectly see, and I actually really like doing my homework there. So, if you had better lighting in your bedroom, would you be more inclined to study there? I mean... Maybe, like, as long as I wasn't, like, completely comfortable, um, yeah. Honestly, it's kind of hard because my window is in a weird position. Okay. And it's not really that big, and the blinds are weird, and there's a bunch of gross stuff in it, so. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm thank not you gonna... for those details. <laughs> okay, she's <laughs> You asked me for it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, distractions come up again in studying. Uh, they suggest eliminating distractions. What do you, what's a distraction for you around the house besides the cats, obviously? Yeah. Um, and mommy and daddy. Uh huh. Well, you guys aren't normally there. So really no distractions for you to worry about then. Except the cat constantly going. Well, yeah, we do have some needy cats that require attention. Yeah. Oh, yeah, wait. There's also another. Well, my one cat, Leota, also has a different way of um, causing a distraction. Literally just going up on the table, just walking all over my work, and I'm like, really? <laughs> Not joking. Nice. Uh, the last thing they talk about is setting a schedule. So do you, and I guess you do, I mean, you, you don't really need a schedule. You basically take care of this first thing when you get home right yeah um i always try to get my homework done as fast as i can because then i know i have more time to relax when i'm done um and today um even though i really didn't have a schedule and even though i just played it by ear it was just like okay i have some things i want to get done let's try to get them done yeah, and you were very productive today. I was very proud of you. Yeah, I'm surprised. Honestly, I thought I was just going to sit on my bed and do absolutely nothing. And and you were afraid you were going to be bored, you know, with the day off. So good okay. for you. Yep. So the last thing they talk about um, in building learning capacity is really, I guess, the most important. And that is learning how to learn. Uh, so the first thing that they, well, you do, you have to learn how to learn. It's not just, people don't just read a book and pick it up all the time. True point. So the first thing that they talk about is to learn concepts first, then learn specifics. And, and this one kind of resonated with me with your polygon project for math was, you know, you brought it home and you didn't really know what you needed to do. You were kind of confused. So, so we sat down, we read over the instructions and in reading through it, we were starting to get the basic concepts. And then once we had the concepts down of, okay, here's the rules of how it had to be done, then you were able to dig in, figure out the specifics, and then get it done. Yeah. Um, do you find that approach works for other subjects besides math? Because it seems like a perfect approach to math. Yeah, honestly, like... Once you, like, get the whole idea down, then you can go to specifics. That's basically how it goes. Like, let's say you had to study for a science test. Well, what was the scientist about? Right now I'm learning about matter and density. So then you could go on deeper and see, like, okay, so what parts um, do I need to worry about? Like... Um, studying the formulas for density on how to find volume, how to find density, how to find the mass of an object using the volume density, using all the um, information given to you. Mm -hmm. Then you could break it down into the two-step problems, which were like, okay, you got to manually, we give you um, the height, the length, the width, find the volume, take the mass, find the density. And... Um, that way, like, you can break down the two-step problems into the more specifics as well. Yeah, great. So it works across the board. A couple of these are ones that we've already gone over. So they talk about eliminating distractions, which we already know that's a thing. Uh, don't fall behind. So what they mean by this is if you struggle with something, come back to it. Put it aside. So if you've got a pile of homework to do tonight, 
and you get to your first assignment and you're having difficulty, you just don't get it, it's, you know, it's not clicking, don't spend too much time on it right off the bat because then everything else suffers, right? Yeah. Um, so take care of that later, but get rid of all the other stuff first because you don't want one thing that you're struggling with to cause everything else to get. Because then not only do you have a subject or an assignment that you're having difficulty with, now you have to catch up with everything. Um, read everything. How are you with reading everything with your assignments? Um, well, let's take math. You have to read every part of the problem and read all the directions. Some people don't do that. Um, I always make sure I do read the um, directions. Like, we were learning about exponents. Um, and... Sometimes it says simplify the expression, write your answer as a power, and other times it says just simplify the expression, which means you don't write it as a power. Um, and you have to make sure you um, notify that so you don't get the question wrong. Like, let's just say um, the problem was simplify the expression, and it was 5 to the 6th power multiplied by... 5 to the 4th power. Well, I know that's 5 to the 10th power, but you can't write that because it says fully, like, if someone just wrote that, it would be wrong because it said simplify the expression, not write, and does and didn't add write your answer as a power. So you had to um, find what 5 to the power of 10 equaled. Okay. So show your work sometimes, right? Yeah. And And pay attention to what the instructions are. Yep. Good answer. Challenge yourself. Do you find that you challenge yourself? If you, if you have a subject that's, that comes a little too easy for you, do you do extra credit? Do you try to do things in different ways to try to make it a little bit more challenging for you? Honestly, sometimes I don't really need to because the school normally um, does it anyway. Like, um, when I had my one assignment for um, reading, we were reading our novel, and we had to um, answer questions based on the chapters. Well, this week, um, it was a short week, and normally we have them due on Friday, and we only have to read four chapters. Well, this time, we had to read six and have it done um, a day earlier. Okay. So that kind of messed it up, but I was able to um, get everything I needed to get done, and um, I was able to um, complete it. Okay, cool. So the last one that they talk about here is don't be afraid to ask for help. Do you find that you're hesitant to ask your teachers or, or other students or anyone for help if you don't understand something or if you're having an issue? Yeah. What do you think you have to do to, to try to overcome that? I don't know. Like, I have this feeling that if I try to ask them a question, I might be bothering them, even though for teachers it's basically their job. I was going to uh, say, you know, that's exactly what they're there for, right? Yeah, but I don't know. I just can't do that because I don't want to feel like I'm bothering them. I feel like if I ask questions, I'm bothering them. Well, the one thing to keep in mind is that a teacher's performance and success is directly correlated to their student success. Mm. So by you going to the teacher and asking for help, they're making you a better student, which in turn makes them a better teacher. So it's kind of a symbiotic relationship. You have to kind of look at it like that. Yeah. You're there to help each other in that respect. So don't ever hesitate to ask the teacher or don't ever hesitate to ask mommy or daddy or if you have a, a schoolmate who may be picking up a subject faster than you are, don't be afraid to ask them, could you, could you show me how you did that? Could you kind of explain that? How'd you get to that? You know, don't be afraid to ask. Uh, there's no such thing as a stupid question. And you're not bothering teachers when you ask them for help. They're there specifically to help you. That's, that is their job. So just keep that in mind moving forward. So we're going to come back and we're going to talk about collaborating. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. So collaborating 
or developing collaborative skills and values enable you to actively engage others and contribute as effective members of any community. Uh, how would you say, on a scale of 1 to 10, how would you rate your collaborative ability? 10 being the best. Mm, 5 or 6. Okay, that's that's pretty high. I didn't think you'd have that much confidence. I think that's pretty good. I guess, maybe. I think that's good. Um, so they talk about some ways to improve your collaboration ability. Uh, the first being learn how to listen. Listening is very important. Um, let people speak without interruption. Pick out key phrases and write them down for emphasis for later discussion. Again, taking notes, right? And then make sure you understand the point. And the easiest way to do that, because a lot of times people will speak, and if you don't say anything, they kind of assume you know what they're talking about. So a lot of times what I tend to do, just to make sure that I get it, and even to be honest with you in a group, even if I know I get it, I may do this for the benefit of other people. And that is to re repeat back my understanding of what they just said. So if somebody explains to me how they want to have something done or what their problem is, I'll repeat that back to them just so that they can confirm that, yep, you got it right. You know, I may do it in different terms just so it's, it's clear for everybody. But repeating that back tries to clarify it for everyone. How are you at listening? Are you a good listener? I mean, I always want to be. Like, uh, whenever my friends have an issue, I always want to try and understand what goes on. Sometimes I don't have the best solutions for it, but I guess just listening um, would be a major key part because sometimes I just need to let off a bit of steam. Okay. Well, the next one they talk about here is one that I mentioned already, and that's ask good questions. Uh, so the rule is there's no such thing as a dumb question. If you have a question, don't be afraid to ask it. We talked about that. Uh, pay attention to the group. When you're collaborating and you're working in teams, if you think someone might not understand something, uh, don't be afraid to ask leading questions. Uh, there's a there's a famous phrase that a good lawyer uh, only ask questions they know the answer to. And that's so that they can form an argument in their favor. So, and I tell my people at, at work this for customer service is that even if I know the answer to a question or a solution to a problem, if I ask you the leading questions that allow you to answer those questions and come to that conclusion yourself, then it makes you feel empowered. We're both on the same page and the, the mission is accomplished at that point. Mm. So that's kind of a, a human psychological thing where if you feel like you've got the answer, you've reached that answer yourself just by me asking you questions, then you feel fulfilled from it. Two point. Um, think of alternate scenarios. Um, ask questions based on those scenarios. Like, I do this all the time with my guys. So let's just take, for instance, we have to provide a solution. We have to build a report, okay? And that report is dependent on certain data. Well, I'll ask questions like I did today. Okay, well, we need to build a shipping report, and this shipping report needs to look at a customer record, and that customer record might have an address, a shipping address in three different locations. Sometimes information's available at all three. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's different. So what I'll do is I'll start asking questions. Okay, well, you're taking it from section A. Well, what happens if section A is not complete? Do you go to section B? What well, does section A has information that section B has, but it's different in section B? So you kind of start role-playing in this case. So you start asking questions. And what that does is it gets other people to start thinking outside the box, start looking at alternatives, um, start planning contingency plans. Uh, this was something that I learned years ago when I was working in emergency management. So FEMA is great for this. So FEMA will come up with a plan for every contingency out there. 
Because if you don't have a plan for it, then you can't be prepared for it. So you kind of start having, and some of these scenarios you come up with are completely off the wall stuff. Um, but you know, you come up with all of them and then you start coming up with answers for them so that when something happens or a question comes up, you already have the answer to it. And then you can, you can work through that problem. Um, when you're working in groups, do you find that you're taking the lead by asking these questions and trying to get answers or leading people to your conclusion? Or you take a more passive role and, and sort of let the other kids take the lead? I kind of let the other kids take the lead because I don't normally like main roles in anything. Okay. Um, I just feel as though that's too much, too much attention and people are just sort of waiting for you to slip up or something like that. Okay. Well, the next thing that they do talk about is learn how to negotiate. Do you know how to negotiate? What does that mean, though? So negotiate is when you have one opinion, somebody else has another opinion and you kind of need them to either move to your opinion or you kind of need to meet somewhere in the middle. Yeah, I think I'm kind of good at that. Where have you had to do that in the past? I mean, like whenever I hang out with my friends, we're like, okay, what do we want to do today? And it's like, um, it's like... I want to go draw, and they want to go play on the playground, and then we can meet in the middle and say, like, okay, we can play, we can draw, we can, like, play for a few minutes, and then we can go draw. Exactly. So you're learning to compromise there. Uh, you know where else you use it that you probably don't realize? We go to a convention, oh. and you want to buy a toy or a picture or whatever it is, and the man says, well, that's $5. And you say, well, will you take four? And the guy says, either he'll say yes or he'll say no. I don't do that, but you do. Well, but you do that from time to time. We, when you were buying Legos the one day you did that. Or when you were buying your LPS before. They're $3 each. Okay, well, if I give you five, can I have three of them? And you would get those deals. You know, you would, you would get a discount on them. And all that's part of negotiation. Right? Yeah. And you don't even realize you're doing it. Um, model what we expect. Do you know what that means? Um, I guess no. Okay. So if I want people to be respectful and I want them to be nice to other people, what's the easiest way to do that? You, um, you show them how to be nice to people by being it yourself. Exactly. So you model what you want other people to do. Uh, so in a group environment, if you want other people to compromise and be negotiators and be willing to work together, you have to do that yourself. If you want other people to be stick to their guns and, and stick to their beliefs, then you do that yourself. Uh, it's all part of being a role model, which we've talked about before. It's part of leadership, which we've talked about before. So modeling that is no different than what mommy or daddy do, where we try to set a good example. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. People don't always follow that example. Mm. But, you know, given your personality... And given your history, I think a lot of what you do, you model that to other kids, especially, you know, some of the younger kids that you hang around with in the neighborhood. You model that that behavior of, hey, we're kids, but we still have to be respectful. We can't be rude. We can't go around ruining people's property and stuff like that. You do it and you don't even realize that you're doing it because that's just the type of person you are. And, and other kids see that and... They want to be like that, too. And the last thing they talk about is to solicit and incorporate input from the group. So if you're in a group working on a project, you may take that project and break it down into different parts, and everyone goes off and does their part. Um, but it's always worthwhile to engage other people and get their opinions. Like, you like to have a voice in things, right? You don't just like to be told what to do. Yeah. So if I come in and say, Maddie, okay, here's my notes for the show today. 
you know, here's the 10 topics that we can pick from. What would you like to do? You know, that is that soliciting your input and then incorporating that into what we do. So it's, you're a part of it and you're invested in it at that point. Okay. And all that helps in the collaboration process. Mm-hmm. Um, we'll take a little break and we'll come back and we'll talk about making meaning from all these things. So making meaning means to problem solve. It means to question, investigate, and make decisions using a learning process, using thinking tools, and a range of learning strategies to deepen your understandings of concepts. Uh, Think scientific process. You're familiar with that concept. Yeah. So making meaning is using all the tools that you have available, observation, questioning, experimentation, you know, these all go into the scientific method, but it's all the tools you have in your learning toolbox that you use to then understand the knowledge that you get. So it's one thing to impart knowledge on you and you, you have to understand it. It's not just a matter of you regurgitating back what was in the book. Okay. So we did the, um, Gupta empire, We did our research on that. So you could just come back and and tell me all the notes that you had on that and and you would have the knowledge, but you wouldn't have the understanding. So when you make meaning of something, it's getting an understanding of what that subject is. Okay. Um, Can you give me an example of something like that you've done recently? Um, I guess I'll have to go with... My geography project okay. for math. Um, like, sure, I can have the knowledge to find the angles, have the um, formulas for the areas, but having the understanding of um, how it's important, why I'm doing it, how will it affect my grade, stuff like that, um, is definitely a key factor. Yeah, absolutely. And they talk about four specific things when it comes to making meaning. And, and the first being problem solving. Uh, we've already done a, a podcast on, on problem solving. Yep. So you, you're familiar with that. And I think, honestly, you're pretty good at problem solving. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. Uh, the next thing they talk about is investigating. Uh, do you think you have good investigative skills? Um, I think so. That would involve doing research, doing experimentation, and gathering information, taking notes. Yeah. Um, the next one you talk about is having an open mind. Don't blind yourself to other possibilities. Keep an open mind. Solicit feedback and input and accept other people's ideas. So we don't have all the answers, right? So sometimes we rely on other people and get their input to do that. Yeah. Um, you know, I may be in charge of my department, but I don't know everything in my department. In fact, there's, you know, I can't necessarily even do the jobs of all the people in my department. My job is to inspire other people, coordinate other people to get the work done. Uh, and the last thing they talk about is understanding the content. And this is the make meaning part, which I think you've got a very good concept with. Um, at the end of the day, you need to know what it is that you're you're talking to, uh, talking about. You need to review your notes. Um, you need to use your knowledge to answer the questions. So what you'll see going through the study stuff for the Gupta Empire is you will ultimately spend several weeks or several months learning all that information. And then at the end of the marking period, what do they do? They test you on it. And they don't ask you to regurgitate your notes. Right? They're going to ask you questions that are related to your notes that you should have found the answers to already. They, they're not always going to give you the answers. Sometimes you have to find those answers and you have to know that you found those answers. So that revelation comes out later on once those questions are asked and you're like, oh, well, yeah, this is the kind of government they had. This is the kind of military they had. This is the kind of technology they used. So all that comes out during the study process 
And then the last thing, and this is part of the, the scientific method, is to confirm your findings. And you do that through tests and quizzes and stuff like that. So that's really what, what the learning process is. And the last thing, and there's not even enough to, to cover for another segment, but the last thing is the breakthrough point. What do you think the breakthrough point is? Um, I'm done blank. The breakthrough point is when you get it. Mm. You know, you go through all this work, you do all the legwork, you do all the reading, you take the tests. And at the end of the day, you know how to do geometry. You know, because there will come a time later on when you're going to have to put some or most of this knowledge that you're learning to work. Um, you could be building a house and your geometry comes in. You could be teaching a class and your history stuff comes into play. Uh, you could be writing a book and your ELA stuff comes into play. It's that breakthrough moment when it's not just words on a page. It's practical. It's when you actually have a use for it. Yeah. Um, and it's at that point in time that you appreciate all the stuff that you've learned and all the accomplishments that you've made and all the effort that you put in. Uh, of course, it's nice at the end of the year to see those grades roll in too. That's certainly part of the breakthrough moment. Um, and, and, you know, funny enough for me, my breakthrough moment came years after high school uh, when I went back to, to school for uh, computers and microprocessing. And I think I told you this story before, but one of the classes that I had to take for the course that I was in was right angle trigonometry. And I was terrified when I saw that as a requirement because I was terrible at math. And I went into this class thinking that I was going to fail it. Uh, it was going to lead to me failing the entire course. And the first week that I was in there, something just clicked in my brain and I just got it. And that was my breakthrough moment. And it, everything just sort of, it was like Legos. Everything just sort of fell into place. And everything connected, and it all worked out. Um, and it was information that I had had in the back of my mind that I had never had a use for up until that point. And then all of a sudden, it all it all worked out. So uh, that was all that I had on uh, our academic expectations. Did you uh, want to come back with some closing remarks? Sure. All right, let's do that. Go for closing remarks. Alrighty, so for the audience out there, um, it's important to note that academic achievements aren't just getting good grades. I've definitely learned that through this podcast. Thank you, Daddy. Um, it's more about learning, not not just learning um, basic math, history, science, ELA, but also learning life skills like collaboration, um, um, problem solving, all that fun stuff. Like, these are skills you're going to be using for the rest of your life. Like, no matter what you do. Yep. Any shout outs this week? Um, not really sure. No? Okay. Well, good. I think you, I think you did pretty good. I think you, uh, you're firing on all cylinders with these expe academic expectations and, and like you said, it's more than just getting good grades. It's about being a well-rounded individual. Yeah. Uh, and that's what your schools are, are doing. That's what your teachers are doing. They're teaching you how to, how to face challenges, how to face um, complex problems, how to deal with these problems. And they're teaching you. They, you might not see it. And this is really the key. You might not see it now at your age, but they're teaching you how to survive. They're teaching you life skills. Uh, and, and it's all done in a systematic way. Um, and, and I, I applaud the teachers that we have out there today. They do a fantastic job. Um, and it's, it's hard for kids to rationalize it as being anything more than just memorizing stuff in a book. But at the end of the day, it is, it's very important stuff that you learn and you're growing as a person. Uh, I've seen it in the last year, two years of, of how your personality has changed how your approach to problems and how your approach to life has changed. 
that's what, you know, academic expectations are, is that you're going to grow as a person, not just intellectually, but holistically. So, and I think you're doing a very good job of it. Thank you. Before we go, of course, we do want to give uh, some contact information here. Uh, we would love to hear from our audience. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. You can hit us on Twitter at insights underscore things. You can get our videos on youtube.com slash insights into things. You can get us on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. On the web, you can find us at www.insightsintothings.com. You can get our audio podcast at podcast.insightsintoteens.com. You can see us streaming five days a week on Twitch at twitch.tv slash insights into things. And you can subscribe to our podcast on uh, iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, uh, Blueberry, uh, just about every major podcasting uh, source out there. And what else? And you can find our two additional podcasts, Insights in Entertainment, hosted by you and Mommy, and Insights into Tomorrow, our monthly podcast, hosted by you and my brother, Sam. Awesome. Uh, I think that's it. We're done. Bye, everyone. Another one in the books.